welcome everyone to our speaker series, and it's my pleasure to introduce Delissa McMillan from the Allen Institute. Um, and we I'm going to just quickly give you an overview of who she is coming to us today to speak on her work. Um, so Delissa was born on the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, so a fellow Caribbean uh, woman. Uh, she migrated with her, her family to New York at eight years old. Uh, she then went on to earn her undergraduate degree in biology from Buffalo State College in New York. Um, she originally left grad school and joined the U.S. Army and Air National Guard, serving both as a medic um, in both armed services for about 10 years. After leaving the army, Delissa went back to graduate school and she now holds a master's degree in biotech, specializing in bioinformatics and business administration, and a postgraduate certification in biotechnology laboratory management from UMUC. Uh, before joining the Allen Institute, Delissa previously worked at University of Washington in the Voss Lab, researching biomarkers for fatigue in patients with cancer and HIV AIDS on varying levels of chemotherapies using mitochondrial DNA. Uh, before moving to Washington, she worked at a small biotech company, Tetracor, where she was the lead research associate in genomic sequencing. Prior to that, she worked at John Hopkins University on breast and brain cancers that metastasized to the bone, primarily the spine, partially focusing on the role of IL-8. Uh, currently, Delissa works in the imaging department, where she's a research associate supervisor and operations lead for the spatial transcript Homics team. Uh, this is her second role at the Institute as she started as a research associate in the molecular biology department on the RC team. Um, so it's my pleasure uh, to welcome Delissa and I'm looking forward to hearing your talk today. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Okay. We are a team's institute, so we are going to work this out today. Um, let's all right. One moment. Okay. Please let me know when you see my slides. How are we doing? Yep, they're there and they look great. All right. All right. All right, once again, good morning, and thank you very much for the warm welcome and the invitation to speak to you and to share the work that my team and I have been working on for the past few years. As already been said, I'm Delissa McMillan, the, op the Research Associate Supervisor and Operations Lead for the Spatial Transcriptomic Team here at the Allen Institute for Brain Science. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say Happy Pi Day, and to my fellow countrymen in St. Vincent, Happy Emancipation Day. So today I'm going to tell you a story of sorts. That's the easiest way for me to pass on information. And I'm hoping to share a few things with you um, by the end of this. One, how the founding core principles of the Allen Institute is driving science forward. How we are leveraging past single cell and bulk seek work to inform the spatial transcriptomic work we do. How the spatial transcriptomic work on large scale is going to accelerate the advancements in neuroscience. We're gonna round off with an invitation on how to find and use our tools. And hopefully along the way, I'm gonna show you some really great images that's hot off the presses um, to spark your interest in what we do here at the Institute. So I know some of you may be wondering why I'm gonna tell you about the Allen Institute. Well, Many of you already know our core principles and even follow them in your daily work. But as you will see, to know the, and understand why and how we do what we do in the lab goes back to what and who the Allen Institute is. So the Allen Institute was founded in 2003 with the idea of how far can we push the boundaries of science if we brought together the brightest and most talented minds in the disciplines based on three core principles? We currently have five scientific units covering the disciplines of brain science, cell science, immunology, neurodynamics, and the Paul G. Allen Frontier Group. 
Each scientific unit has is focused on identifying and understanding a unique scientific question. And once that question is answered, moving on and asking and answering another. Our three core principles, team science, big science, and open science. When we say open science, we share all of our resources, data, data analysis tools, products, and our own research findings for you or anyone to use in your work. You can also find up to our protocols on protocols.io. We want our work to be accessible and used by as many scientists as possible. Big science. We work on large scale, high throughput projects by breaking our projects into pipelines. In doing so, we have multiple teams, each focusing on their component of a project, allowing expert quality attention throughout the process, following, allowing us to increase scale without decreasing quality. So you understand when I say big science, let's look at one team in particular. The, our RSeq team. RSeq has sequenced through Sparter 417,494 cells. Through the 10X pipeline, they've sequenced 34,994,097,916. Since I bet they're still hard at work at this moment, we're going to round up to 418,035 million. So when I say big science, I mean big, big science. And this is only the numbers for one team. Now, I started on the RC team when I first started out here. So I always got to go back and reference the work that they do. For what they do influences the work I currently do on my team in the Spatial Transcriptomic Lab. Now, one of the most important things about the Institute is the importance of team science. Every project at the Institute has a dedicated group that specializes in the techniques that make a project run. Each team makes up a part of the continual flow of data that is then released. This is currently my team. I'll tell you a little bit more about each one of them a little later because each one is a critical member in the success of the projects. I'll show you later. But Big science needs team science. It is very difficult for us to accomplish any one without the other. Also, as a minor plug, I'm currently hiring to increase my team. So if you know any recent grads, please send them my way. If you are still wondering why I've spent time talking to you about a core principle, it's because you cannot fundamentally understand the things we do unless you understand the why. Some of the whys. So we've been collecting data from day one and sharing this with the public. The next step in atlasing is the spatial transcriptomic atlas. So since communications is still working on this slide, I'm going to squeeze right in here spatial transcriptomics as that's where we're going to go. Let's talk a little bit about the importance of spatial transcriptomic data and how the ongoing effects to understand and visualize gene expression in the brain. As I mentioned a bit ago, we use large scale processes in order to get our data. So gene expression is no difference. The spatial atlases that have already been created at the Institute are on wide use today. So we have 24.7 million views on our atlases with over 418,218 users. These spatial atlases show anatomy and cytoarchitectural structures. The ISH atlas seen here, oh, my pointer. The ISH at atlas shows one gene at a time, as well as we have the mesoconnectivity atlas. We built upon those previous atlas to develop the spatial, to develop this transcriptomic atlases to understand the cellular identity through gene expression. 
We now know by analyzing the whole mouse brain that it contains over 5,200 gene clusters. Each cluster is not defined by unique expression of a single gene, but by the identity derived from unique combination of the gene expression. You're probably wondering why the importance of a spatial transcriptomic atlas if we already have two great, we have several great functioning atlases already that combines all of those things. So why? Well, the spatial transcriptomics gives you the relationship to other genes and their cell types. Let's think about it this way. Single cell transcriptomics looks at one cell, one cell at a time without the information and how that cell interacts and responds to the cells around it. Spatial transcriptomic gives us this information. As you see in this figure, transcriptomics requires the disassociation of the cells from each other and into and of from each other and then are individually sequenced and analyzed. While spatial transcriptomics maintains that spatial association and leads and yields layers and layers of additional information from just explaining the association from one to another. We spatially pro we spatially profile using MRFISH or multiplex error robust fluorescent in hybridization. In situ hybridization. This is based on single molecular fluorescent in situ hybridization, SMFISH, has steadily become has steadily been used to study the copy number and how RNA and spatially organ is spatially organized in the cell. That can be looked either at isolation or in the tissue. Murfish combines single cell transcriptomics with spatial biology by visualizing and counting up to a billion RNA transcripts from hundreds to tens of thousands across a centimeter square tissue slices with single cell resolution. Murfish enables us to perform high highly multiplex in situ spatial gene profiling across whole tissue slices. In my lab, we generally image across coronal sections in mice profiling for 500 genes at a time. In non-human primates, we also probe for about 500 genes, while in human, we probe for 140 genes. Using MRFISH ability to include barcoding increases our ability to image more RNA and reduce the chances of misidentification. Here, I'm gonna take one moment to explain barcoding because I figured this was like one of the most difficult things for me to grasp about the whole MRFISH, I just wanted to say. So during hybridization, which is done on the bench, we apply a probe to the tissue. These probes remain on the tissue for up to 36 hours. This probe tags each gene across, across the tissue with what I like to call bunny ear, the bunny ears of the, the sequence. We then apply an acrylamide gel over the top and allow it to clear for 24 hours. During imaging, each round of the readout each round, a readout is then washed across and it then attaches itself to the applied probes. Depending on which gene on the readout is attached, it then fluoresces and reads the colors. So if you see here, gene one in round one fluoresces with one, as well as gene two and gene five. If you look at round two, it's turned off. Gene one is turned off as well as gene two, while gene three five and six are turned on. This goes over, in this example, it shows you four different rounds. And if you look closely, each round is separated. So at the end, when we look in the, at the end, when we look, we can identify which gene is exactly there based on when it was actually fluoresced during that round, identifying the gene at the, at the end of the process. 
So now, if, for example, an error has occurred and say gene four is turned on in a round where it should be turned off, because we go through so many different rounds, it, it, the error robustness of the of shows comes through where we are able to filter that out and actually correctly identify later on. So this is important to understand why we, we are very confident in the images that we see at the end. So we're going to talk about a little, a little bit about why now we go into big scale when we do these. You know, as powerful a method as, as Murfish is, we have to basically scale up. And this goes back to our one of our core principles of big science where looking at one specimen in most lab, that's really cool, that's really great. But we need to be able to duplicate this hundreds of times over. So let's talk about how do we go up and we scale up. Now, now one of the reasons is to look at the reproducibility of a project. Now, the other reason we scale up is if you look here, in order to create the next generation of whole brain atlases, as you can see, brain sizes vary. We image at on 10, we image 10 micron slices, one cubic centimeter at a time. No, I'm sorry, a one centimeter square at a time. So we have to be able to scale up in order to cover these large area surfaces in order to do whole brain atlases. Mouse, non-human primates, and also in human, which requires many, many slices. So how does it work? The first thing we had to do was develop a clear and concise workflow. What you're gonna see is basically a combination of workflows in relationship to our pipeline. As you can recall, we use interdisciplinary teams. So to create a pipeline that's even more true as we scale up the work. The first step in the pipeline after gene selection, which we use the bulk seek data in order to develop our gene panels, we then look to our other teams. We have lab animal services who takes care of our mice and we, we get our specimen from them. We then transfer our samples then go from lab animal services down to our histology team who perfected slicing, imaging, slicing, and also the fixation of our tissue. Then it's handed off to the spatial team. The first thing our team does, we're responsible for the bench chemistry. We hybridize, embed, and we place on our commercial platform for imaging. Once imaging has occurred, we then, which on the MERSCO, which takes between 16 to 32 hours, analysis happens. And the analysis happens both simultaneously on the analysis, on the analysis machine within the commercial products. Once that initial analysis is completed, data is then transferred. And we'll talk about a little bit about the data transfer system because that's also very important to what we do. Once the data is QC'd, once the data is transferred, it's able my team to get in there, QC it, and test, and test out what we're seeing. And then it's handed off to other teams and our scientific staff for further analysis. Now we currently run eight MERScopes, which we process 32 samples. We're up to 32 samples a week, and we have imaged over 600 samples since, our, since starting our lab. So whole brain atlases require few, hundreds of sections. You can't scale up equipment unless you scale up personnel. The original MFISH program had a series of RAs and scientists who laid the foundation for the work that we are currently doing now. In December of 2021, the spatial transectomic team was created in order to do and advance this work. I want to emphasize that all the work I'm going to share with you today and all of the data was a complete team effort. And I would like to introduce you to my team. 
Jasmine Campos was the first RA on the team. And Jasmine is, loves the development of new SOPs and the integration of new technologies into our pipeline. She is currently working with the 10X team to refine the protocols for the 10X Xenium platform in order to integrate that also into our system. Next, and our team who came to us in January of last year is Naomi Martin. Naomi is responsible for a lot of the initial QC work and a lot of the images you'll see today. The most recent additions to our team is Nasmil Valera and Paul Olson, both quickly learning and integrating in our team with a lot of the wet bench work in the process. This team has some impressive big science numbers as well that I would like to share with you. With possessing three to processing three to four sections a week, per instrument, up to 32 imaging runs a week, generating 112 terabytes of data weekly for up to 450 terabytes a month. We are currently starting the process of incorporating the 10X Genomics Xenium system, which we have the potential of generating 24 terabytes of data per run for 72 terabytes, potentially yielding 288 terabytes of data a month. If you like me, when you see those numbers, you probably are thinking, where do they put all that data? Well, here's the way it flows. It's rather simple to see that managing the data is be a critical part of the flow of the pipeline. So it starts with two teams. The engineering team and the data and technology team are primarily responsible for maintaining and flow of our data. So the it starts on the MERS scopes. Once imaging is complete, raw data is simultaneously transferred both to the analysis computer and to the CEP, which is our online computing cluster. Once the analysis is completed, it is then transferred to the CEP. So we have a secure point for all of our data. Once paper, once all the data is, is analyzed, papers are published, the data is then transferred to various repositories, including the bill and other long-term storage facilities. At our peak, we have the ability to generate 512 terabytes of data per month. It is critical for this flow to work smoothly in order not to slow down our production. So what does the data look like? So over the last year, we have imaged four whole mouse brains. We are about to start our fifth, and here you are seeing a brief overview of the first three that we've completed. Mice one and two, we're imaged with a different gene panel. So we were focusing then more on the forebrain in the first two gene panels. With the third mouse, we generated using a whole brain, more gene panel, which flowed over more of the, the brain to identify more genes. Many people have been asking about the release of the whole brain data. Just to give a quick plug, you can read the full paper, a high-resolution transcriptomic and spatial atlas of the cell types in the whole mouse brain right now on BioArchives. At the end, I'll give you a QR code so it'll be much easier for you to find. So once we get this data off and the work is done, the pipeline is built, we needed to test to make sure that all that work um, actually worked. In our system, we built in a series of checks. And one of the things we do is we look for layering using a series of laminar markers. And we look in the cortex as well in other regions of interest based on the scientific goal. Now, we look at various different markers. So I want you to take and remember these layer effects as I show you some images a little later. 
some merfish. So as I said before, we have the ish atlas, which does show gene expression already viable, great atlas. Check it out. Um, so we're able to use that to then go and say, are we seeing what we're seeing? Have we proven this before? So I pulled out six, there's six different genes here. So when we look at these six genes, we then do a quick comparison and make sure that we are actually looking and that what we see in MERFISH, we can actually refer back to in the ISH atlas. Because remember, we're probing um, in MERFISH, especially in mice for 500 genes at a time. And so we always want to go back to the ISH atlas and to make sure that we are seeing localization where we expect it to be. So with this gene, we see localization in MERFISH here, and that is that correlates really well with what we see on the ISH atlas. So it takes a lot and it takes a lot of time, but I think it's important for us always to go back and make sure that we validate the work we do, um, especially as we're passing it out um, for other teams. So one of my favorite quotes by Madame Curie is, I am among those who think that science is great beauty. Science has great beauty. Now, for the remainder of my presentation, I would like to show you some of what I consider some of the most beautiful images. Um, and I know this is what you've been waiting for. So let's take a look at some of the recent work put out. This is one coronal section with all 500 transcripts. So when we open up the visualizer, uh, this is what we see. When everything goes perfectly right, when the cell, this, cell, this coronal section has great overall dense coverage, um, we don't see any major issues. Um, so let's look at this and we'll just basically follow this, this one coronal section. So now when we blow it all out, here's the section separated showing all 500 genes that we probe for. These genes are listed in alphabetical order. I'm not gonna go into each and every one of them. Um, this wonderful chart was created by Michael Kuntz, one of the lead scientists um, on our part of the image department. And this, this is, he is really the leading force behind the whole brain mouse project. So this is one of his images that he created. So I'm not gonna go over all 500. So I picked out three that I found really interesting. So the three I picked out was ANKFN1, BCL11B, and POU3F1, which is down here. So let's talk a little bit about ANK FN1, this yellow gene expression right here, which is a, it's a gene and it encodes um, for dependency. A lot of um, this has a lot of implications in cannabis, de cannabis dependency and hallucinogenics. So when you think of those things, these are, has a potential um, in those. So then we can go over here to B BCL11B. And this gene, um, as I've been reading, encodes for a lot of deficiencies as um, immunodeficiency 49, in um, blocks in intelligent development and T cell abnormalities. And the final gene that I'll be bringing your focus to, which is right here, which is POU3F1, um, which basically is um, has implications in several different carcinomas, including some, um, scrotum um, squamous carcinoma and um, sinus cancers. So um, each one is significant for different different reasons. So now let's take a closer look at those three genes and how they, in particular, look in relation to each other on that particular section. So this is the this is the visualization or how they look together in in relations to each other. When we look at this Im this image, it looks like a lovely painting. And if we look at 
A and K, F and 1. And then we look at it on the ish atlas, on the ish atlas, um, we can see how it nicely correlates where it's found in these regions right here. And then we can then again see it on the mer the merfish imaging. So we have a great look that what we're seeing actually matches up. And then I'd like us to take just a closer look and we're gonna we're gonna focus in on this square region. I think it's beautiful the deeper you go in and the more you zoom in on these images, how how beautiful they look. And so as we zoom in here, we can see the differences in the laminar um, in the laminar pattern that are indicated from pia to white matter. And you can see the differential gene expression across all those layers and how they interact in relation to each other. Something I should mention is that we are what we're looking at here are images taken on the VisGen Merscope. And what I've done here is collapsed all of the Z planes um, into one. So when we image, we image seven different planes starting at zero, which is the closest to the cover slip as we go up to the top of the tissue. Um, and as I said, my team is responsible for most of the spatial transcriptomic work in, for brain science. So mouse is not the only species type that we look at. So I want to transition a little bit and go and talk a little bit about another one of our species, the human. Um, so to describe the human imaging process, we'll have to take a little step back. As the human project, we're not looking at whole brain slices. As I showed you in that earlier image, the, dip, the, the disparity in sizes between a mouse. In a mouse, we can do coronal sections and we can cover the whole brain with 59 to 60 sections. For the human brain, that's a, a lot dip, more difficult. So instead, we, we have to portion out the brain. Um, and we have a phenomenal human team that works on this. Um, and so, for example, the Human AD Project uses sections from multiple donors with varying degrees of disease impact. Specifically here, we're going to focus in on talking about what they're looking at in the middle temporal gyrus. And we also have been looking at, in the last imaging run, we were looking at the DFC. So we have two different portions, but for this, we're going to concentrate on the middle temporal gyrus, which is what we have here, that part sectioned out and removed. So we have the side view, and then of the middle temporal gyrus, which we have right here, and then we then have to partition off that. Remember, we always want to be able to associate everything back together, so we have, we have to take detailed um, images of every portion. So we then cut out another portion, and then we have to dissect that and cut it down again. This smaller portion is then separated into four different pieces. The, the, AD, team, the AD team then sends my team a portion, which is nine times out of 10, this triangular region. So this is the way it looks. It's then embedded in OCT and sent to the histology team where once imaged, we start out with an image that looked like this in the end. So go from brain, section, section down further to imaging. So let's take a look. Similarly, to I showed you how wonderful um, 500 genes look in a mouse section, I'd like to for you to take a look. Um, here's a similar picture in human. As I said before, we probe um, at 140 genes for the human, for cell, for, for the cortex, I'm sorry, for cell types when we're mapping in the cortex. So I know some of you may be thinking, why only 140 genes for the human tissue? So unlike the mouse, we are dealing with a relatively small number of of cell types in the human cortical area that we've profiled so far. So we're taking a deep dive on past knowledge. So we know this small number of cortical cell types already. So we're taking a closer dive at, at, at those and we're looking at the gene expression within those. 
So just like in the mouse, my team takes a look at laminar at several different genes that express within the layers. And for the human, it's similar. So we take a look at the CD22. As you see, the CD22 has this beautiful layering. It starts off with this beautiful layering effect. Now, once we add FEZF2, we can separate into we see another layer become clear. And we continue to pile. We have warp B, which creates another layer, and then a SAP B2, which puts another layer. So which gives us, and then we add on CUX2, which so we can see all six layers clearly defined when we when we look. So just like we look. Um, in, within the cortical regions of the mouse for all those nice layering effects. The same thing we do in the human, which we like to make sure that we have from PIA to white matter um, in order to then when we reassociate them back together so we know exactly what part of the brain we got them from and we have a nice clear look. So why layer matter in the human tissue? The, human, the AD team aims to compare that data to the RSeq results taken from nearby human sections. So when we section off into four, my team gets the triangular shaped and RSeq gets an, an adjoining piece. And so we want to be able to, um, to match those results taken from those nearby regions. And of course, they aim to compare that data to other regions and other work. However, if they look at the entire wedge and slice, their results can often turn and be disproportionate into excitatory, inhibitory, and glia cells, even in the adjacent tissue, depending on the minor changes in the shape or tissue damage. They then, therefore, need to draw a computational line through the rectangular subsection in the layer one to the white matter in order to normalize their comparison Additionally, the layers change in AD due to plaques or other problems leading based on the degree of um, onset of disease. So it's important that we show the layering because we want to be able during analysis to cut a line straight across to get clear tissue um, to do analysis and then quantify that with other results. And having, and having that is important. Um, information going forward. So I've shown you mouse, I've shown you human AD, and as I said, we're a cross-species team. So the final image before I conclude is I wanted to show you from one of our, our non-human primate data sets. So we, as I said, we're currently profiling our non-human data set with a 500 gene panel. And I pulled, this is one of my favorite, one of my favorite images, because as you can see, you can see the clear defined layers throughout. Um, and you can see how well defined, and you see the structures, you see the form within all the layers of this slice. So I know some people are wondering why we've decided to include non-human primate as a part of our work. And one of the reasons is, that working with non-human primates, such as macaque, as this um, section is, is that the at these atlases just don't exist right now. And having a better understanding of what brain-wide gene expression and distribution looks like for hundreds of, of gene expression is much better than the tens that currently exist. And it just increased our knowledge base. And sometimes increasing the knowledge base helps that individual creature. The next question is how does studying non-human primates help humans? Even though it's not a human brain, there is still implications for human diseases since macaque is potentially our closest model organism that we have the ability to study. So the macaque on its own shows is a powerful in research itself, we, just learning about the macaque. But if we look at a comparison, comparative way to human as a model organism, we, gain, we can glean lots more information to help further the understanding of the human brain. 
So in conclusion, oh, during 2022, we fully established the pipeline for spatial transcriptomics at the Allen Institute, where we can generate up to 32 sections a week. We continue to increase our data generation with the inclusion of new commercial technologies on the way. Our scientific staff is led by Michael Coons, Brian Long, Jenny, Emily, and they've developed an amazing pipeline to filter, map, and align to the CCF. We've improved our understanding of how transcriptomics identity, a transcriptomic identity relates to the spatial location across several species, including mouse, human, and non-human primates. And we've successfully generated data for multiple projects that have already been including in several publications. So publicly shared tools is something I wanted to share with you. So our tools can be found um, on the Allen Institute website, where you can go to the brain map, where you will be able to find our ish atlas, as well as our other um, atlases that we have. Also, lots of the images that I showed you today can be found on these sites. As some of you may have known, last Monday, and I mentioned earlier, last Monday on BioArchives, where our new paper was released with all this spatial transcriptomic work in collaboration with our collaborators at Harvard the, um, and UPenn. And you can find that article here. And also cell science and the job listing that I mentioned for my team. I would be remiss if I didn't share the wider team, my team always phenomenal as usual, but this is the wider team that supports the work that we do. And in conclusion, I just want to say thank you um, to Paul G. Allen, our founder and creator, and for all of his generosity um, and his vision and encouragement. Thank you. I'll take any questions anyone may have. Awesome. Thank you, Delissa. Um, like she mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you can unmute and ask. I did have one like logistical question. So you showed some data on the slice of the human brain. Yes. How, how did you get that sample? And like, is there room for, I guess, like, you know, there are folks who donate organs and different things like that. So like, what's that process like, and how do you get access to those materials? Um, I know um, we have collaborations with um, local facilities and local hospitals. Um, so we we get our samples through collaborations. Um, we don't have on-site um, harvesting of, of non-human primates or the human brain, but we have collaborators that we get um, sample tissue from. Awesome, thank you. And then you mentioned if everything worked out perfectly <laughs> um, in terms of like storing all of the data. I guess, can you talk about like some of the failures and how, you know, that impacts the data set that you receive? Yes. So we have we have lots of challenges. So one of the challenges first is sample preparation and collection. Um, you know, some of it because especially human and non-human primates, they're not controlled within the walls of the Institute, whereas some of our other specimens, our mouse line, that's tightly controlled. We know the protocols that we harvest um, and prepare with. So there is the longevity of some of the um, tissue that we receive. So there may be degradation in the tissue. And especially as we see in AD with advanced disease onset, um, tissues harder to um, to deal with to manage. There's plaques. There's um, weakening of the tissues, the, the actual structure itself. And what we do when we image, we're basically putting these um, tissue through a series of wash stripping um, with um, TSEP of the readout. So we're stripping away there, and so the tissues can become de degraded even in just the imaging process. Not to mention when histology goes to slice it, so we have a block and we're slicing them down into 10 micron slices, um, there's a, the potential of 
stretching um, and ripping happening there too. So we have lots of steps along the way where we have to basically QC and to look at the tissue. So we do nissel staining after um, at we with one section to test out that block to see if we will have those layers that we need to get that full um, that full coverage. Um, what we do in our lab, the Merscope, is not an inexpensive thing, and we try our best to be good stewards of the generosity of the money that we are entrusted with, both through grants, um, through the federal, through our NIH grants, the BICAN grants that we have been awarded, and also um, in the money that um, we've been endowed with. So we have to look at making sure the samples that make it to my team are in the best possible shape from harvesting straight through sectioning. Um, all the way through imaging. And that's why I think it's important to have specialized teams. Each yeah. team is really, really good at what they do. Um, and so it's very important that we have well-trained staff. Um, I know I can. we can give precious tissue to the histology team and they're going to churn out the best possible product. Yeah, as you were speaking, I was imagining all the logistical <laughs> um, things that have to happen prior to the actual imaging of these tissues. Like you talk about like the histology and the slice in the brains and my brains are so small to begin with. It's so like mm -hmm. imagine um, how that is um, as like a, you know, work process and workflow. But that's amazing work though. Yeah, we start, I start out, so my main focus, I, I tell people all the time, I'm Eric Traffic Control for my team, and I interact with all the other team leads. So every team has a lead, has someone in my position, and what we do is we get together and we go, how do we flow this project? And it starts out three months, whether I work, I'm working with the human AD team, um, or if I'm working with um, the non-human primates or um, the mouse team, and we look how the flow is going to be, because it's not only us. If internally, if it was just Allen Institute bubble, we can possibly work it out. I also have to work with our commercial vendors, um, our commercial vendors to get the products in. And when you're imaging at a large scale, a lot of times, um, I get vendors who look at me go, my product wasn't meant to do this. Our product wasn't meant to image at the pace and at the scale that we go. As I said, Jasmine on my team is phenomenal on day one at breaking any company's imaging machine and then helping them build it stronger. And that's what we do. Um, and so that we're able to do this. And then with internally, um, we have other teams managing. So uh, our Merscopes can only hold 14 terabytes at a time. That doesn't work for me. Um, so we need to be able to go on. So we have data technology and their focus is to focus in along with engineering to look at how much data I'm putting on and making sure that we're not impeded and that data continually gets sucked away. But in a way that it's QC checked, someone is there at all times to be able to see where it is, where it's at. At any time, one of my scientists can go, Delissa, I need the specimen that you image, specimen 10 that you image in January 3rd of 2022. And I need a way to be able to pull it up. That's where our software um, engineers on the engineering team have developed a system where I can quickly pull that data up. I can tell you how long it took for that one section to, for it to go through the entire pipeline, the entire process, where it's located. Is it on the set? Is it, is it in AWS? Is it, is it on the bill? so that they can process it. And I need to be able to do that. And that's only possible with all the teams working. Awesome, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions from the group? Yes, thank you. That was amazing. Well done. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. Hopefully I explained what we do here and hopefully you go back to some of those resources because everything is truly out there. We're currently that the data that I showed you from that paper is currently going up to Bill so anyone can access it um, really soon, as well as the, the visualization tools we use.